Hey everybody, Dr. Dan here. This week we're talking about communication. So you might be wondering why are we talking about communications? Why did we talk about transportation? How does this fit into history of business in the U.S.? So uh, there's a couple of pieces to that and there's a lot to unpack here. But in the grand theory, all right, in order to have growth of business, you have to have transportation networks and you have to have communication networks. You also have to have a banking system and a stable currency. We really haven't talked about that part yet, but I just wanted to start you out with really um, the infrastructure piece. So transportation was last week, communications this week, and really I like to present these uh, together because they're very similar in some ways when you think about um, the evolution of transportation, also the evolution of communication, it really moves from this somatic model uh, really to a more analog mechanical model and then to a digital model. And uh, what I mean by somatic is when I talked about transportation and really the way things were powered early on, I, I speak in terms of somatic because that's a fancy way to say of the body and that means like walking is somatic transportation and a horse or an ox is somatic transportation and and so communication was really that way also early on so when we think about you know 1609 1619 the first colonization of North America all the way up to the late 1700s uh, even farther uh, it's actually all somatic communication that means it's word-of-mouth communication or printed or or letter writing communication which is, in some ways is still a, a, a physical type of communication because a letter or a book or a manuscript has to be handed off from one person to another so that's what I mean by that so um, as far as the history of communication in the US is concerned and and how it plays out in business again it's all of this uh, word-of-mouth or letter writing up until the mid 1800s and um, you know we'll talk about the telegraph but before we do that um, I, I, I want to stop talking about America for a little bit and I want to talk about a development in France in the late 1700s and it was really um, what I called Napoleon's Internet, but there was a guy named uh, Claude Chappe, so it's C-H-A-P-P-E, and, and I'm not a French speaker, despite my last name, so I'm not doing the word any justice. But, but uh, Chappe's system was a system of towers. It was a visual communication system using semaphores, and there's a link to actually a, a really good BBC webpage that will explain it in detail in the reading this week. So I won't get into the detail, but just know that uh, Chappé's system really in 1793, 1794 radiated outward from Paris and it was a series of towers that could communicate messages visually. And there was a, a whole code system that uh, was invented by Chappé along with it. And it's cool and the reason it's relevant is that really when we look at the history of network communication, um, we need to consider Chappé's work in the late 1700s. The other thing to consider about this is that it was largely sponsored by uh, the government because it was a defense uh, thing in order to communicate throughout uh, France and, and actually into Germany. Um, uh, um, you know, Napoleon saw communication as really important. So I, I just want to plant that seed that the government funds a lot of these early technologies worldwide, generally in uh, for defense. So when we talk about the internet and the ARPANET here in the U.S., you know, in the 1960s and 70s, uh, 70s again, it was the Department of Defense that funded that originally. So keep that in mind. Okay. So uh, as far as America goes, it's all letter writing books, newspapers, all of that stuff that we already talked about, and uh, we move on to sort of the first uh, electronic, but it's really electromechanical uh, communication, which is the telegraph developed in the late 1830s. Now, um, everybody, you know, every American textbook you're going to look at is going to say Samuel Morris invented the telegraph, and it's not true, and it's important to know that um, most of our histories are very American-centric or Western-centric, and that makes sense because um, there's, there's this whole historiography that, that means the philosophy of writing history that, you know, especially in America, we tend to favor the American inventors, but, but it really uh, wasn't Morris who invented it, 
and um, um, it, 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 there's, it's, there's a long story, but, but really I would, I would credit the Brits with it. There was a, two guys, uh, Charles Wheatstone and William Cook, and they actually got a patent for a telegraph in 1837, which was a year before Morse did. Uh, but again, um, you know, as from a Western-centric or an American-centric point of view, Morse is generally accredited with the invention, but, but actually, even if you look at this a little deeper, there was really a guy named Joseph Henry who was a professor at Princeton uh, back in 1831 who wrote papers about the telegraph and actually had a working model of a telegraph around his classroom at Princeton. That's in New Jersey. So um, this is important from a history standpoint because, you know, don't believe everything you read, do your research. So when we talk about information literacy and how that plays into history, uh, this is a great example that, you know, Morris is the one who's credited with this, but really he wasn't the one that truly invented it. But what he did do was uh, he had a systems technology, and that's an important point. So when we look at the history of business and the history of technology, People that put together systems generally do pretty well. And by a systems technology, you know, Morris had come up with the Morris code, uh, which is the dot, dash, dot, dot, dash thing, which many of you, if you're students right out of high school, probably have never heard of before, but maybe you have. Uh, but, but so Morris came up with a system uh, and coupled it with the device. So he had the code, the way to communicate, and the device, and system technologies generally do pretty well. Actually, going back to Claude Chappé in, in France, he had a system technology also. But anyway, just kind of keep that in mind. Uh, when I talk about system technologies, think about radio and, and think about television, the, the network, the cameras, the systems, the technology all bundled together um, is, is something that generally uh, does well because putting together desperate parts of technology generally doesn't work well. So there's that part. Um, after we move from the telegraph, we get into the telephone. Uh, let me get off track a little bit. As far as government involvement goes, uh, the telegraph was largely sponsored originally um, uh, by the government. There was a lot of interest by our Senate in using it uh, nationally as part of the post office system. It didn't develop that way in the end. Uh, but it is important to think about and, and also think about this idea of technology and defense. During the Civil War, the telegraph was actually used. Uh, there were actually spotters up in hot air balloons with telegraph keys and wires running to the ground uh, in the 1860s by the Union Army so they could sort of fly over the battlefields in a hot air balloon and uh, figure out what the Confederate Army was doing. So there's sort of your defense angle to the telegraph. Uh, a lot of people don't know that. If you're interested, just, just look it up online, and uh, there's a whole bunch of information about the telegraph and the Civil War. Uh, moving on. So uh, the telegraph, again, around 1840, 1844, somewhere in there, and then uh, the next thing we move to is 1876, and that's Alexander Graham Bell's invention of the telephone. But just like Morris, you know, Alexander Graham Bell is seen as the big hero the inventor of the telephone, but it was actually uh, developed by a guy named Antonio Meucci in 1849 in Italy, or at least some semblance of the telephone system. Uh, but again, as far as American history is concerned, we always think about Alexander Graham Bell and the Bell system and AT&T, and um, that's, that's the standard line of history. I guess uh, what I want you to take away from this is that always do your research. So if you read that Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone, then make sure, you know, you have all the information in the world at your fingertips now. So either go to a library, go to the internet, do your research, and uh, make sure you know what's really going on because everything you read, even if it's in a textbook, is not necessarily true. And I want you to be uh, critical thinkers. I want you to doubt everything. And I, th I think it's important, especially now politically when we talk about uh, fake news and all of this other stuff that it's really important you know what you're talking about and uh, do your research up front. So enough on that. The telephone, 1876. Um, something I talk about when we think about the telephone is that there's a big difference between invention and adoption. And invention is like, you know, when the phone's invented, but adoption is when society actually starts to use it. And, and it's, a, it's a real important distinction. Um, if you study the history of technology and you're a historian, 
there's something called uh, 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 technological determinism. And it's just a fancy word for historians to debate about whether or not technology influences history. And I think it does, but it's important to understand that technology doesn't stand on its own to influence history. Uh, society has to adopt a technology, so people, human beings, are really the deciders, and uh, we really dictate what technology is used, and therefore that has an influence in history. So you can develop an atom bomb, and it's just sitting there, that's great. Um, if it's used, it, in, it influences history. If it's not used, the technology on its own didn't affect history at all. So hopefully you can understand that. For those of you who are history majors, if you hear this uh, word or this phrase, technological determinism, uh, that's what that is all about. But for the rest of you, don't worry about that for right now. It's just I, d I don't mean to make this not fun. So uh, where are we? We are at the history of the telephone. And, and I, oh yeah, okay, I was talking about adoption versus invention. Uh, the telephone wasn't adopted right away, so it's not until um, 1900, 1910, 1920, somewhere in there where the use of the telephone starts to grow exponentially. And uh, prior to that time, uh, actually there were a lot of predictions, and there's a link on the, uh, on the reading for this week. Pardon that ding in the background, that was my email. Um, there's, uh, there were a lot of predictions at the time that the telephone would be a, a total flop. But I think if we uh, look back at it, one of the things that is not considered is that we sort of have a biological need to communicate with each other um, in, in somewhat of an intimate fashion. And, 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 you know, voice is a lot different than letter. So I think that's one of the reasons that the telephone was adopted. That having been said, the next prediction after the phone was the video phone, and that never went anywhere. I mean, we, st we have FaceTime today, obviously, and video today, but um, that's not the kind of thing that was ever widely adopted, and I think there's some reasons for that. Uh, we, don't want always, we don't want people to look at us, basically, always, but the voice is okay. You can be in your pajamas and talk, and no one knows about it, but you don't really want to get a video call when you're not prepared for it. So I'll leave that to your imagination, but, but I think uh, that's something to think about as well. So, I mean, you know, these technologies, video, video telephone, and then the flying car, uh, these were all things that were going to happen, and they weren't ever adopted. They were invented, but not adopted. So, there's that. Um, the other thing to think about with the telephone is the development, and it's definitely a systems technology. I mean, the Bell system had, uh, you know, the phones themselves, the wires, the network, the switching devices, the operators. That's a big deal. It is... Um, also an, a great example of a high capital industry. In other words, it was uh, very expensive to set the network up. And when we talk about antitrust and monopolies and government regulation of business, um, which you know we'll talk about with uh, uh, Carnegie and, and Rockefeller and those guys coming in the future, but, but I want you to think about it in the context of the phone system because uh, developing the phone network was a very capital-intensive um, uh, venture. In other words, it took a lot of money up front to put the system together. I, I mean, I couldn't have gone out and started a phone company in the 1940s. I would have never been able to afford the, uh, the phone poles, the wires, the networks. And, and, and therefore, with the growth of uh, AT&T, which was the original Bell company, uh, the government started to regulate um, it was a, a public-private uh, regulation. It started to regulate uh, the phone industry and phone rates because it was so hard for anyone else to gain entry into that business. So when we think about the history of business in the U.S., um, these, these quasi-private public enterprises, uh, certainly the phone company was one of them, and eventually the Bell System, AT&T, uh, was broken up in the in the uh, 70s and 80s actually into different phone companies so but then technology changed all that again so there was a lot of disruption in the telephone market in the 80s and 90s anyway not to get off track but but just think about that um, capital intensive enterprises are very emblematic or very typical of this period of time between the late 1700s and really I would argue up until the time of the internet and the reason I say that is uh, you know, you really can't start a phone company with a network on your own or an automobile company because of the high cost of getting into it, uh, figuring out uh, manufacturing, buying plants, all of that stuff. But 
what you could do is you could start a Facebook tomorrow with uh, one computer hooked to the internet and some coding knowledge. So really technology and business changes as the need for capital decreases and, and technology is often part of that. And, and there's sort of this complicated interplay between uh, technology, capital, and social adoption. So, you know, think about Facebook for a second. I'm getting off track, but not really. Uh, think about Facebook for a second. Its valuation right now is uh, over $500 billion. But, but if you look at General Motors, uh, General Motors valuation is about, you know, $56 billion. So is Facebook worth 10 times more than General Motors? If you look at its stock price and you add up all the stock that it's out there, it certainly is. Uh, but the funny thing is, I mean, Facebook could go out of business tomorrow and it wouldn't affect us at all. I mean, hospitals would still take care of people, food would still be delivered to markets, everyone would live uh, and actually I think would be better off socially, but that's an opinion. Um, but, but just think about that when you think about technology, society, and business, how things change and really it's what people value, it's what people adopt that is worth the most in the end. But, you know, investing doesn't make sense anyway. So, so there's that. So anyway, um, moving on as fast as I can. I'm sorry this is going so long. We talk about the telephone, this adoption between 1910 and 1920, and really it dominates business and personal communication up until the Internet. And, and so next, when you get into the course reading, we'll talk about the Internet. I don't spend a lot of time on to it, but I do give you some, some decent links but I mean there's a whole bunch of us out there who know life before the internet and I'm certainly one of them and it's hard to put a starting date on the internet uh, in some sense so when we talked about uh, Napoleon and Claude Chappé in, in France and the importance of Chappé's system to national defense the internet here in the US was actually originally defunded or funded by the Department of Defense and it was called the ARPANET and, and that really occurred in the early 60s to the mid 70s and there's lots of debate on the dates but but really none of that matters because the the internet wasn't usable by us uh, really until the 1990s uh, there was a, a gentleman named Tim Berners-Lee he's European and uh, the internet or the World Wide Web I'm sorry he invented the World Wide Web which runs on top of the internet which gives us the ability to see web pages the ability for you to view this video online the ability for you to take a class online the ability to uh, order stuff from Amazon or whatever you know talk about uh, cat videos on Facebook or on snapchat so um, read about the history of the internet it's it's interesting but but know that it was originally funded by the Department of Defense uh, here in the US and and um, of course everyone in the US tries to capitalize on it uh, Tim Berners-Lee the inventor of the World Wide Web never did he gave it away it was open source when we read about uh, intellectual property I think I mentioned him and and people like Ben Franklin who didn't really believe in the patent system they just thought that you invent stuff and you give it to society uh, for the good of society and Berners-Lee is certainly a hero in my book for doing that so um, that's the World Wide Web again it's very much now it's it's sort of a systems technology if you will I mean the web was invented by Berners-Lee and that's all well and good but it wasn't until browsers were invented and they would actually run on PCs that it started to be something that we could adopt here again is this idea of adoption um, as a society so the first browser was really mosaic and uh, it turned into Netscape and most of you don't know what Netscape is because they're long gone um, it's hard to follow the technology everything moves so rapidly um, the other thing I want you to get out of this chapter and I'm, I'm sorry I'm jumping around a lot but it has to do with this notion of adoption um, when you do the reading about the telephone it's important to read the predictions and there's a couple of links to predictions out there that the telephone would never amount to anything and um, you know think about that and also when we think about the PC the personal computer the internet there's there's predictions out there uh, by various people that that say hey you know no one's ever gonna want a computer in their house or the internet's never gonna make it I remember being in college uh, back in the day I'm not gonna give you any years but I remember having a professor uh, actually at the University of Toledo 
uh, communication professor who, who thought the internet was not going to change a thing. It wasn't really going to be adopted. So it's not the fault of these individuals to make these predictions. It predictions. It's just, it's just bitter hard to make a prediction in the context of the time. Um, if computers are really expensive, it's easy for someone to say, oh, no one will ever have one of these in their home. Um, but it's not until you predict that the prices are going to drop with adoption, and then you can start to say, well, maybe people would have something like this. So uh, read the predictions, take them for what they were, but, but don't make fun of the people that make the predictions because it's hard for you to understand history in the context of the time. And, and that's one of the difficult things about the, the subject in general. So uh, I've talked for 20 minutes. I apologize, but go through the readings this week. We'll have an assignment to do, and uh, be safe this week. Go Rockets. Have a great day. Bye-bye.